Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending upon what part of the country you're in. Welcome. My name is Eric Sellers now, and um, I'm with Jobs for the Future and uh, a very happy partner in the uh, PIA project nationally. JFF is a large national nonprofit that uh, works at the intersection of education, training, and work. We've been doing so for almost 40 years, and I lead our Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. It's been operation in four years, and we do a ton of work with states and locals and boards and colleges and employers and a whole lot of other work in uh, for the Center of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Um, while this will never be ex as exciting as having a bunch of apprentices on, uh, like the previous section, which was outstanding, by the way, kudos to you guys for that one, really smart young people, but it's almost as cool because we have real live employers here and people who work with uh, these young people and provide them opportunities. And I'm going to guess, and you can disabuse me of this notion, I'm going to guess you've been totally impressed by many of the apprentices that you have had as youth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So I've got a series of questions, and I'm joined uh, by a range of folks in the South Carolina Charleston region. Um, but I, I don't know uh, uh, all the names of your companies, so you're going to have to help me with that. But as I go through, I'm with Debbie McLeod, Don Drake, Donald Smith at Hendrick Auto. Um, who else do we have here? Uh, David Brown with uh, Kion Group. Uh, Kion. Roxana uh, with HCA Healthcare. And the rest of the introductions, I'll let you do. But we've got a great group of folks here um, who provide uh, not only opportunities to students and are helping out young people advance, they're also developing a pipeline of the future. Um, they're uh, spreading uh, uh, good skills throughout their community, not only with their job, but certainly in maintaining work skills and work values and really is a big issue in um, training our next generation of workers. I wish more folks around the country would do what the Charleston region has done, but um, I always tell people across the country where we go that there's a lot of programs out there that are doing youth apprenticeship. Look at Charleston first. That region, great relationships with employers, a good central intermediary with Trident Tech and a range of very good partners from K-12, to community college system, employers, uh, and business associations. So with that, I'm not going to waste any more time. Um, the monitors of this uh, session might want to give me the hook or a warning when well, we've got about five minutes left because I know me and this group will love to talk about this issue and can talk about it uh, for uh, uh, a, long, a lot more time than we have scheduled today. So give me a heads up if we're running over. But um, thank you, um, Melissa and Mitchell and all the other folks at Trident for helping organize this session. Um, so let's just jump in it, right? I mean, we talk about apprenticeship as being employer driven. Uh, whether it's youths or adults, uh, we in the apprenticeship supply side of things need to make sure we understand what employers' issues are, what their concerns are, what their skill needs are, what their future workforce challenges are. So we really need to get the employer's point of view on this. Um, and then there's the other side of what the system can do in providing appropriate students to help the employer solve that problem. So we want to sort of address the history, how your programs came together, um, tell us a little bit about your company and the program, how's your experience been to date, and we want honesty, we don't only want to hear good things, if you had a student who had challenges and you had to sit them down for a while, that's fine too, that's part of the process, uh, but we do want to hear uh, very much how, they, how these things operate, so in other parts of the country we can sort of replicate some of those themes that you're doing. So I'm just going to jump right in here, and I think I'm going to start with Debbie McLeod. Debbie with... Um, no. All right, Debbie, tell, tell us a little bit um, about your company and what you do for your firm, Deborah. Okay, so I'm Debbie McLeod from McLeod Information Systems, and I'd like to say thank you for having, us, having me on today. Um, we are a cybersecurity company. We were one of the first in the state of South Carolina to put a registered apprenticeship program in a cybersecurity business. Um, the I am the president of the company. I'm also the apprenticeship director. And the reason that we chose to do this is because of the job shortage. There's approximately 3 million short worldwide in um, cybersecurity. So we, my husband and I collaborated and we decided that it would be beneficial for us uh, in the industry that we're in to grow our own pipeline. Hmm. So I love that term, grow your own. 
Uh, I often use that with apprentices because you're in fact doing that. Um, and cyber is a really interesting space to get to. There's a number of cyber apprenticeship programs across the country um, at various stages, because I think it's still all being worked out. Um, so you looked at the job shortages, you looked at, um, which is very situational, right? Pandemic related, post pandemic, you don't know where you're gonna get your workers from. So you decide to grow your own. So what did you do? How did you connect with this system? Um, uh, and did you know how it was gonna turn out when you started? Um, so what I did, because I have my um, histories in education, I knew that schools have intern programs. I was, I was in one myself. So my first approach was to contact the local school district about having interns and I got no reply. So I decided to investigate that a little further. And in my investigations, I came across Apprenticeship Carolina who came, sat down, they brought the local school district in, we sat down and we talked, we explained what we wanted to do, everybody agreed that it was definitely needed, and they, through doing that, um, we partnered with Trident Tech for the educational portion of this um, program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's an interesting uh, experience. Um, was it Trident that you've so Apprenticeship Carolina is known for having, I call them navigators, but apprenticeship consultants located throughout the state. They're usually attached to a community college, which is great. Was it a Trident consultant that reached out to you at first or just another one from Apprenticeship who then ended up connecting you with Trident? I initially approached Apprenticeship Carolina and when they came and they understood that um, the local school district hadn't replied and we wanted to start out at the high school level, um, specifically the underserved population. Hmm. Um, so once we sat down and we put all the pieces together on how this was gonna come together and how, what we wanted my program to look like, that's when they referred me over to Trident Technical College. That's great. Um, uh, so apprenticeships are far different than internships. I was also a high school intern and a college co-op student, um, and apprenticeships are far different. Um, uh, and I think you've made out on the deal with that, right? Um, I mean, it really is, um, you know, a real way to integrate, integrate a possible pipeline of workers where interns are mostly just for the experience of the student. Um, did you encounter any unexpected challenges or problems, or was it like you were discovering new and interesting things every day that worked for your program design? So far, we haven't um, had many challenges. And in reference to the internship, the purpose of that is with cybersecurity, we wanted a limited amount of obligation from the student. So the internship pro program lets them know and lets us know, is this a good candidate for an apprenticeship? Mm -hmm. So that's the purpose of doing it that way. Um, but through the whole program, we really have not, everything has been pretty much what we expected, except for what we did not expect is everybody who works in the company wants to participate with the apprentices. <laughs> they, everybody sees that as the most energetic and exciting part of our company. So that was a little unexpected. And then how much we love what we're doing and how much um, we have seen these apprentices grow through the program. It's been way more rewarding than what we expected. You know, I've heard that before, Debbie. That's an excellent proposal, uh, excellent uh uh, uh, comment to make. Uh, we were working with a healthcare, a hospital up in New Hampshire, and the staff were actually fighting over being assigned the apprentice because it, it sort of changed their organization. You know, they describe it very similar to you, and it 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 juiced up the staff, and everybody wanted to help out. And you know, I mean, as as far as recruiting future students, what a great welcome for them to have everybody interested in them. Um, so, uh, so how long have you been doing this and how many students have you uh, been able to bring on? Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about 
scale. Oh, did you bring on 100 students? Did you bring on 10 students? Um, uh, you know, and there's uh, a lot of policymakers and politicians like to say, we want 10,000 apprentices. But the reality of the workplace is not everybody's going to absorb a huge number, and that's fine, right? But, um, you know, as long as you're doing that sort of work with somebody. So how long have you been involved in it? How many students have you been able to serve? So we've been involved in this for um, a little over three years, and we have, we just took on our third apprentice, so it's relatively one each year, it's what mm -hmm. it's been equaling out to. Uh, we are a small business, so we have to take these uh, um, new apprentices in as the funds become available to do so. So our goal is the more we grow the business, the more apprentices that we have. Right, right. Well, look, and even if you only get one, one a year, right? Uh, in five years, you're going to have five highly skilled people in your office, right? In 10 years, you're going to have 10. So, you know, they do expand over time uh, and that's fine. Um, uh, in terms of an investment, sometimes we hear employer, employers say, oh my goodness, there's a lot of startup costs. I don't want to be associated with that. Uh, I want to find something else. I mean, it sounds like you had a lot of energy, a lot of focus and some effort in trying to find the connection. Was there a lot of investment up front? Was it a onerous process up front? Or once you found Trident, things worked pretty smoothly for you? There wasn't a lot of um, investment on our part. And as I just spoke at an international conference last week, um, two cybersecurity people across the world and that was one of the things that I mentioned to them as whenever they were looking at the ROI perspective, because that's always something that IT seems to want to throw up constantly. Um, and my response to that was a response that I had heard IBM make, which is you either invest now or you lose now or you lose later. Because right now we have a pipeline um, emergency and you're either going to spend that money training them up front or you're going to spend that money in the rear training them afterwards. So you pick which pathway you are wanting to lose, but mm -hmm. you're going to either lose now or you're going to lose later. So as far as an ROI, we personally feel like it. we're already seeing that growth and whether we see it in dollars we, or, or it's more so that we see it in the lives being changed. And that to us is way more rewarding than seeing the dollar signs. So let's talk a little bit about the logistics of this and working with Trident and doing something called a registered apprenticeship, which seems to have a lot of mystery, myth, and me perception surrounding that term around the country. But um, uh, I, I want to, uh, you know, how was it working with your local colleges, Trident? Um, and uh, was it a burden, if you will, in registering the program? I hear lots of employers say, oh my goodness, the paperwork was terrible and it's so hard. And I usually hear that from employers who never tried it. Um, but I'm wondering how that experience was for you. Was it onerous? Was it easy? I wouldn't say that it was exactly easy because there was the cybersecurity um, education outline had to have quite a bit of tweaking, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, and that had to come with us sitting down um, once we got that put in place. And I wouldn't say that's exactly tedious and laborsome whenever you already have in mind what your expectations are and you already know what your career field demands, that makes it a little bit easy, um, easily accomplished. Trident was very helpful. They're, they're still helpful as far as Anytime we have questions or um, just if something needs to be done um, through the Department of Labor, they're quick to let me know, hey, we need this part, you know, and it's so no, I wouldn't say that it's been onerous and as I would lean more towards it's been a little bit more easily done. That's great. That's great. All right. I'm going to, the last question for you, I can actually continue this conversation, Debbie, all day. I do think cyber is a really interesting space. Your comment about um, having to tweak the curriculum at your local training provider, 
is exactly how this system is supposed to work. If a, if a training provider educational institution cannot meet your needs, but are willing to, then you need to tell them the skills and the curriculum and the things you need the student to have. And our job as practitioners in this space is to meet that challenge and to be able to customize an apprenticeship program to your needs. So I'm sure the college made out on your contributions, um, you did and certainly your apprentices would. My last question to you, Debbie, is if you had to sort of had a group, a room full of employers, what sort of recommendations would you make to either employers or other community-based partners who are just starting out? So, and the cyber employers or employers in general? Any employer starting an apprenticeship program, I'd love it if you lean towards IT and cyberspace, but you know, any employer who's getting ready to get involved in this because we have employers from all over the occupational and industry spectrum. So the one thing that I'm consistently, I repeat myself um, all the time is when you're looking into these programs, especially if you're going to start with the youth programs, do not overlook your Title I schools and your underserved populations because especially in IT, they, they tend to lean towards wanting the cream of the crop, thinking that they need to go into the magnet schools or the charter schools. But within the walls of these underserved schools are students that have a lot of potential who just need those doors of opportunity to open for them. So that is the one thing that I'm consistently repeating over and over and over. Do not overlook them. You need a, you need students from each of those categories to balance out your program. Many times I tell employers, you know, at minimum, it should reflect the demographics of your community, your apprentices. Um, you know, and, you know, look, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, there's, there is oftentimes where people say, oh, we want to go to the, uh, you know, the, the magnets or the gifted and talented programs when there's talent right in front of them from a lot of other places. I will tell you though, from an employer point of view to have you leading with that is really important, right? Because um, many people are trying to figure that out, but you as an employer saying, look, we wanna make sure everybody in our community has access and opportunity to enter apprenticeships. And certainly IT and cyber are probably male dominated for the most part anyway, probably. Um, racially dominated by uh, whites versus others. And actually the data would tell us that. So, so good for you. That gets you a lot of bonuses in many different ways. So thank you, Debbie. I'm probably going to come back to you. So don't go anywhere. Thank you very much. Really interesting that we led with cybersecurity. All right. Who do I have next? Uh, going to ask similar questions to Don Drake, HMGI Charleston. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Hi, where are you? I see everybody on my screen, but. Oh, well, there you are. Hey, hey Don, how are you today? Doing fine, thank you. Good. Tell us a little bit about your company. Well, we're a, a 32-year-old company. We're a restaurant and a real estate holding company, mm -hmm. mostly in uh, the South Carolina area. Mm -hmm. Are you in the Charleston region or all over? We are. We're in the Charleston region. Okay, great. So tell us a little bit about... Now, my last visit to Charleston, I happened to visit another a number of culinary apprentices. It's my favorite thing to do uh, when I'm on the road. Tell us a little bit about why you entered into this apprenticeship. We know the hospitality tourism industry is a big thing, particularly in the Charleston region. Um, I'm assuming that's what drove some of this, but tell us a little bit about why you got involved in, in this apprenticeship work. Well, we've been involved with apprenticeship programs now for roughly about 30 years, and then um, Having uh, you know previous experience with uh, the larger culinary schools like you know the CIA, Johnson and Wales, and you know et cetera, those schools, Cordon Bleu and, and New England. So we we've been we have good practice with the apprenticeship programs, and then we have three of our former uh, employees are actually chef instructors down at Trident, and we have two chef instructors at the local high schools. So we we got a really good feedback when Mitchell uh, approached me about this new program. We were really excited about it. Um, it's like everybody else, we're experiencing, you know, a labor shortage. And, you know, you, with the last visit to Charleston, you're well aware of a, a, of the numerous restaurants that open consistently in, in, in the Charleston area. So labor pool is pretty tight. But um, it was pretty easy. Uh, it was pretty easy fit for us having, you know, 
many, many years of experience with uh, the other apprenticeship programs we're involved with. Mm -hmm. And are they, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, are your apprenticeship programs front of the house, back of the house, um, chef and cooking? Are there other occupations or, or wh where have you settled in on your occupation? Mostly they're in, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, I'd say probably the more majority of probably 85% of them are in the back of the house. The other 15% are in the front of the house. But in our apprenticeship programs, we rotate, um, you know, when we get, when we, we, when we're approached by the students or we approach the students that, uh, you know, they're assigned a mentor and then um, the mentor takes them through their particular area that, you know, they specialize in. And then we hand them off to another mentor, you know, street communicate, see what kind of progress they are. And then we always switch them on, but uh, it's, uh, it's, seems to work out well for us, you know, the, the apprenticeship program we are, but by the time they leave us, even if you're in front of the house or back of the house, mm -hmm. you spend time in, in all areas. Right, right. So how many, um, you know, for, uh, for the Trident program, and I realize that, you know, in your business, particularly if you have many properties in many, many locations, you need to have a a number of people coming in to, to train and you work with some of the colleges or post-secondary institutions on this. So when, when you first started talking to Mitchell about bringing high school students in, um, did that make you gasp? Did it make you stop and think? Were you worried about alcohol on premise? Were you worried about kids showing up? Uh, or, or what, what, what was some oh, of I can't concern? say that I was, I was worried about all the above. <laughs> For sure, um, especially when, um, you know, the, like the first round we got, you know, they were really young. You, you know, some of them were uh, 15 to uh, 17. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you were, you know, I have children of myself, my own. And I was like, oh, because, you know, uh, a restaurant can be, a, you know, it can be a, uh, you know, it's a really fast paced moving environment. There is uh, all the stuff you mentioned, you know, involved with this atmosphere. And so. I'm pretty protective of them. Um, I really, really uh, get, uh, before we start any kind of communications, I sit down with the parents and the kids, and then we talk about the job, what's expected of them, how this is gonna work, transportation, school work, uh, all the above. And then we let, it, we let it roll for a little while, and then we sit down again with them to make sure that you know, they're keeping up on their grades, you know, everything's going well at home along and on and on the work front. Wow, Don, that is a really smart thing to do. You're sort of helping, <laughs> helping set the expectations and the guidance for those young people to follow because they'll, they'll need that. Um, yeah, I think I'm really, really, with, it's really, really important, especially with, with, the, with the younger kids that we, we get the parents involved with it. And, uh, you know, we take this thing as a whole, but uh, it's, uh, are just seeing phenomenal results with, with the younger guys. I mean, they're just, they want to learn, they want to learn. And like, uh, uh, you know, they, they're really, they're like a sponge. They suck up any in, information you send to them. And then the parents relate to, you know, they're, they're trying different stuff at home and they're cooking for their parents or cooking for, you know, the company when they come over. So it's been really exciting for not only us, but to see the parents as parents too, and see the, the kids grow into the field already so mm -hmm. quickly too. So, so uh, your concerns that you had initially pretty much have gone away because of some of the experiences that you've had and some of the systems that you set up. So you, you're not hesitant anymore about bringing in a 16 year old, for example. Oh, no, not anymore. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem. We do limit now. We do limit the, uh, the time frames that they, they, do, they can work and they do work. Mm -hmm. You know, we uh, stick to most of the time, you know, uh, if depending upon the grades, you know, they usually work on the weekends, uh, and you know, and reasonable, most time they work during the, you know, when they first begin they work on, in the daytime hours, you know, under, because we have more of an older crowd in the daytime, you know, all of us are, you know, thirties, forties, fifties. So, uh, they, they have a lot of, you know, multiple parents around. And so, uh, we keep a good eye and watch them until we feel comfortable with them. And then, you know, then, and they make some progression and then we switch them a little bit more to, uh, mm -hmm. uh more different areas. So this question may be better for Ron or David or, or some of the others or Don, but um, any concerns about liability on your end? You're taking this responsibility. I'm sure you had to sign something. Um, you know, you have meat slicers, probably you have hot stoves. Any concerns about liability that you had? 
And if so, well, how'd you address it? Oh, I, you know, of course, we always, you know, stress safety in the kitchen. And then, you know, uh, when it comes to the, the, the apprentices, uh, you know, any kind of uh, workman's comp and stuff is covered by the college. And so it's under the contract, you know, they sign with those guys, mm -hmm. which, you know, takes some of, you know, some of the liability off of us. But um, we always, you know, stress, you know, a, a safe environment. But I don't really have any concerns because, you know, everybody practices good, you know, work practices, you know, in, in the kitchens. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, again, you know, it's, we try to keep everybody on safety level. So uh, it's been working out well. Uh, I don't really have any concerns. That's great. Um, and uh, can you estimate of, well, I had a, I had a CEO in Switzerland's apprenticeship program say to me, look, if they apprentice for me, that's great. If they move on to one of my competitors, that's fine. It's good for the industry. And if they leave me and go back to college, that's fine. Cause it's good for the country. Um, how do you feel about uh, hiring? The, uh, do these folks stay with you after they go? Do they spread their wings and go on for other jobs? Tell us a little bit about what happens at the conclusion of an apprenticeship. Well, when it comes to, especially the ones that come from, uh, you know, the, the culinary schools directly, I'll find out if you can get them in their last quarter of their education, and then you go into your apprenticeship program, usually we have probably 100% retention rate. Mm -hmm. They usually stay with us for, you know, probably two, three years. A lot of, a lot of them have a, you know, career, you know, stay with us, you know, for, the, for, the, uh, for as long as they, you know, until I got out of college. But, um, you know, I always, always stress, you know, being, I, you know, I did my apprenticeship myself, you know, years and years ago, uh, but, you know, um, I encourage everybody to, you know, to, to come in, learn as much as you can, and then uh, go on, in your, you know, in your field and, and learn from the next guy you think is, you know, who can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, you know, I try to learn on the best chef you can and go to the next chef and learn the best you can, because, you know, when you get an opportunity to open your own place, you usually only get one crack at it. If you go, hey, mom, dad, can you loan me some money to open our own restaurant? You know, usually you only get one. And you need one of them to be successful. So uh, we have, a, you know, an excellent track record. The people who graduated from our apprenticeship program and who've left, you know, our, our restaurant group are, you know, they have their own restaurants. Some of them have, you know, corporations themselves and multiple restaurants. So uh, whatever we're doing, you know, and with the help of Mitchell and his crew, it's been really, really successful. We've helped, uh, you know, uh, I think we've contributed to the field, you know, where they, I think mm -hmm. when you leave Magnolia's or our, our group, I think you can work at any restaurant in the country. Yeah. 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 That's some uh, serious uh, restaurant business down your way. Um, all right. And lastly, uh, before I go to um, Ro Roana is what recommendations or advice do you have for anybody in hospitality or really any employers who are just starting out on this? We're working with sites all over the country and the hardest thing for many of them is to get started. So what sort of recommendations or thoughts do you have? Well, um, like, you know, the, the, uh, speaking before myself is, you know, you want to tweak your program to fit your needs. There's not one set program, eight to set parameters, and then you tweak yours to, to fit whatever your needs are, whatever your uh, establishment is, or what type of food you're doing. But um, works works out well. But, you know, what we've doing now, uh, we're working on is, you know, like somebody mentioned before, you know, the underserved or the minority community uh, is mm -hmm. that uh, we have a lot of the restaurant workers who realize that, you know, they never really graduated from, from high school. You know, they, 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 they reason to error their way. So now they're, they want to, they want to get a certificate. They want to get their education. So we're really working on that program now where uh, we're putting them through our apprenticeship program. We're getting them to education. So at least they're getting a GED. They're coming out with a working certificate. So uh, they're feeling a lot better about themselves and we're giving them a reason to mm -hmm. further uh, pursue their career because, you know, it's hard to pay the, you know, it's hard to pay your rent and your bills, uh, you know, on, on minimum wage. So uh, we try to give them, a, you know, a way out. And with that program, you know, you guys out there think about it. It's such a win-win situation for your local community, the people that you serve. If you know, they can come out, you know, if, with a, with a high school education, with a journeyman certificate, and with a college education paid for without owning any college debt, student debt, it's, you know, it's a win for everybody. Wow. I highly encourage you guys to get involved and, and get started, you know, as soon as you can. Great. I'm going to edit this, cut that out, make a commercial out of it. That uh, You're absolutely right. No college debt 
And, and to me, these programs are not secondhand. They're not alternatives to college. They're uh, everything, uh, in my view, is equal to the preparation that two or four years can give you in the uh, in the workplace, in the marketplace. So uh, oh, very, very much so. Yeah. So, Don, thanks so much. Um, stick around. We may come back to you. Um, I got a bunch of questions for all of you. I'm sure they're going to give me the hook too, not too soon, but Rowana, am I pronouncing that right? Rowana Payne with HCA Healthcare? Yeah, it's Rowana. Rowana, I've oh. seen you before. We may have had this conversation before. Um, anyway, thanks for joining us, Rowana. Tell us a little bit about HCA Healthcare, if you would. Well, um, we are Trident Medical Center here in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a subsidiary of HCA. We are about a 300 bed hospital. We're an acute care trauma hospital and we have had apprentices with us now for five years. Wow. So um, we started out, Mitch and I were friends away from work and he approached me away from work, just socially chatting and telling me about the program and asked if we might be interested in having youth apprentices in our patient care tech program. And I said, hmm, sounds good. I've got to run it by HR, I've got to talk to the CNO, you know, to the C-suite and make sure everybody is happy with what the idea. And Mitch and I pitched it and they said, go for it. And the rest is history. So the moral is never go out to dinner with Mitch because he's going to hit you up for apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, we, we, we talk about everything and yeah. um, it, it was a good segue. You know, Mitch did the right thing and laid some creativity and I'm not sure, but I believe we are the first hospital in the Charleston area to use the patient care tech apprentices and mm -hmm. they've rebranded us to pre-nursing apprentices mm -hmm. now instead of patient care tech. And the other hospitals have since jumped on board as well. Oh, wow, that's, yeah, I've seen that happen in communities. You know, uh, you, you can't get the upper edge on the competition because you all are, are challenging, you're all are struggling for the same talent, right? In the same labor shed, so, so it's tough. So, you know, you've been doing this for five years. You've obviously had some apprentices that have completed uh, their work with you. Um, so as you look back on the last five years, um, how has that worked out? Have they stayed to continue to work with you? Have they advanced on the college? Have they dropped out and gone to see Don and work in a restaurant? What, what sort of reflections do you have now at the last five years? We've seen the gamut. We've seen some that have started and have just flat out said, this isn't my cup of tea mm -hmm. and have left the program. We've had others from a scholastic standpoint that could not keep the grades up to make the program work. We had others where parents were pushing them through the program and they did not want it and finally spoke up. Mm -hmm. And then we've had the opposite end of the spectrum where we have had the folks go through, go through the program, complete it, go on to nursing school and come to work with us. So that creates a nice pipeline. And the advantage to us in healthcare is if we can get them as the high school kids that are truly interested in healthcare, then their enthusiasm and willingness to work hard to become a better caregiver go up. So we get a better product when they finish. Mm -hmm. So when they get through with the apprenticeship program, they go into the nursing program, they stay with us working as patient care techs in the hospital, then they come to us as graduate nurses. And so their orientation and onboarding process at that point becomes a little quicker because they already know the system mm -hmm. and they start at a little bit of a higher salary than somebody with no experience coming in as registered nurse. Mm -hmm. So you sort of made the same point that Debbie made earlier, which is, you know, growing your own or, you know, spending time and investing in these workers, you know, you really get to customize it to your needs, right? To what the values are of HCA healthcare, right? Where you just, you know, people talk about buying and building a workforce, right? You can go out on the market, put out an ad and buy a worker, 
right? Or you can build a workforce through things like apprenticeships, which it sounds like, uh, you know, both you and Debbie were sort of talking about how that works. Um, Rowena, so, <clears throat> so here we have a, a major healthcare facility and we have 16 year olds and 17 year olds working in there and around patients. Isn't that danger dangerous? Isn't that risky? Don't, you know, do people, I mean, these are not candy stripers, right? These are people who are working and getting paid, but they're young. How do you trust them in a hospital? Environment. So the process starts when they complete their applications with Trident Tech. Trident Tech does a fantastic job screening and eliminating those that are not meeting the criteria or not completing applications. And then they send them over to us and we review them and then we interview them. We put them through a hiring interview just like I would any other employee and we selectively pick who we're looking for. And we tend to not lean towards the 16 year olds. We're looking for somebody that's a little bit more mature and believe it or not, there's a difference between a 16 year old and a 17 year old. And we tend to pick rising seniors into the program because of that maturity level. Now, we also make sure that they understand that they're not going to get to work in specific areas within the hospital from a liability standpoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We only allow our apprentices to work in the med surge adult units. So they can't work with women's, they can't work with children, they can't work in the ED or behavioral health. And that's a safety process for them as mm -hmm. well as for the patients. They also complete a CNA or a certified nursing assistant curriculum before they even get to set foot in the hospital and start orientation with us. So that sets these kids up a leg above a lot of other people that apply for patient care tech positions because they're coming with a solid knowledge base already mm -hmm. that we're just gonna continue to build on. Mm -hmm. So that helps cut down on our liability. The other thing that cuts down on our liability is we lay expectations before them, just as the other folks have said. They've got to keep their grades up. You may wind up having to give up going to the prom because you're having to work on a weekend to get your hours in for us. Mm -hmm. They um, cannot work past 11 o'clock because they're not adults yet. And so we're concerned about their safety as well. And some of these kids are still on driver's permits. So we have to be very mindful about how they're getting to and from work. So we do take all of that very seriously. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is, and this, you know, this happens in manufacturing too, where there's a lot of dangerous equipment. You're managing your apprenticeship system, right? Certain things you can do, certain things you can't do, but those expectations and the way to manage that, um, you're not going to get in trouble because you have sort of a guide and an outline to what they can and can't do, right? Um, so that's fabulous. So um, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to move on. But but how would you talk to? So healthcare is a really interesting field for apprenticeships, right? Healthcare has always had practicums and clinicals and things like that, but rarely had apprenticeships. They had apprenticeship-like things for nurses or um, you know physical therapists or whatever. But but what advice would you have for the healthcare industry, which is looking more and more at apprenticeship all over the country? A few are doing youth apprenticeship. Um, you're definitely a trailblazer here. But what, what advice would you have for any of those employers, employer, sorry, healthcare systems that are interested in apprenticeship for youth? The first thing you have to do is make sure that you've got the support of your C-suite, your upper level management. Mm -hmm. HR has to understand that these kids are going through a hiring process a little bit differently than a regular employee. And they have to understand that we have, when they're accepted into the program, all we're doing is the cursory work to make sure that the background check is okay, that their issues with their um, drug and screen testing and, and all of that stuff is the way that it should be. Once we get them hired, we've got to make sure that there's a well-defined orientation process with one person coordinating the entire process that follows up with them to make sure that they're meeting their hours the way that they should be, that they're meeting their 
checkoff list for skill sets that they're keeping up with what Trident needs to know in regards of the things that they're doing, taking care of the patients. They have an app that they're typing in what they're doing to care for the patients. And that has got to be all kept up. And we keep them on orientation a whole lot longer than we would somebody that is coming in as an adult into the mm -hmm. role. So we keep them from August all the way through till December on orientation before we give them a little bit more autonomy. Mm -hmm. So you've got to just keep a close watch on them and be very supportive. And communication is the key. Great. So I have one more question for you. I'm not going to let you off though quite yet. So by the way, audience, feel free to ask questions or chat them, or actually we have a Google sheet in which you can send your questions on the Q&A tab or link. But Rana, what, um, so there's a question from uh, Jill here that says, besides the fact that she says you all are so impressive, um, how did you navigate the scheduling process uh, for the related instruction? How did you make sure that they got off to go to school, that they were finishing their high school classes, that they were going over to Triton to take classes? Um, it must be one heck of a matrix you did. But how did you figure out the timing and scheduling of students? That was easy. <laughs> I did, truly, out of, out of everything, that was the easiest part because Trident Tech tracks their grades for us. Then as they finish their coursework, I get their grades. And anybody that does not pass a course, then it becomes my decision through the hospital to determine whether or not we're gonna keep them on through the program. Are we going to wash them out of the program and let them stay on as a patient care tech? Mm -hmm. So that piece was fairly easy. And what I do is, um, sit down with the kids when they start and they tell me what times that they can work. And then I build their schedule based on what they tell me that they can work. And some of these kids choose to work a 12 hour shift on a Saturday and maybe an eight hour shift on a Sunday or they'll work four or five hours after school in the afternoon. And we've got the support of our managers on the med surge units that allow these guys to come in and work those type of hours while they're on orientation. Then once they come off orientation in January, then it becomes the manager's responsibility to manage their schedules with them. And they're met to meet the expectations mm -hmm. of what's required of the patient care techs on those floors. Okay, that's great. That's great. And and Debbie and Don, do you have scheduling problems? I mean, particularly in the restaurant business, you guys probably have scheduling that changes every week or two. Um, just real quick, because I need to get to Don first, uh, and then David. But um, Don, any scheduling problems in your industry? Uh, for me? Uh, no, not not really. Um, we like, you know, uh, I don't really have any schedule problems with them, you know, like everybody else. Uh, restaurants are busy during the holiday seasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you take that into consideration a little bit because, you know, uh, you know, everybody wants to have Christmas off. Everybody wants to have Thanksgiving off, Easter, all the stuff like that. If anything, that's probably the only time we really have scheduling issues would be during the holiday season. And then uh, we just deal with that, you know, as yeah. best we can. All right. And uh, Debbie, how about you? You're, you're pretty, I assume you're mostly a nine to five operation scheduling an issue with you? Correct. We're mostly nine to five. So hours are, and scheduling is really not an issue for us. No okay, great, great. Yeah. Hospitals, you know, 24 hour operations are a little bit more challenging. Um, let's talk to Don and then I'll, we'll wrap up with David, um, and, uh, Don Smith with, who are you, Hendrick Auto, is that who you're with, Don? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. I'm Don Smith with Hendrick Automotive Group. I'm director of community relations, and I'm the guy to go out and hire the youth apprentices. All right, so how big is your organization? Do you have multiple, uh, sites and dealerships and all that, or just one central? How, how big are you and how many apprentices do you take on a year? Well, basically we have nine stores, a body shop and a, and a consolidated business office here in Charleston. And we have 105 stores nationwide. Mm. So why, uh, 
I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but I don't know why, how, and why did you guys get into apprenticeships? It's a, I mean, it's a terrific industry because there's, it's always changing. There's new things people need to learn, whether it's sales or finance or body shop or, or mechanical. So tell us a little bit about why you got involved and where do you focus your apprentices on? Okay, basically, um, I was a GM of, a, of a, the Volvo store here in town for 20 years, and mm -hmm. I found out that we had to go out and recruit technicians. And basically, after a couple of years, I realized we had to grow technicians. So when the Youth Apprentice Program came about, um, we just signed up because we said we had to grow apprentices. So the best way to get them is out of high school and right into the dealerships. So um, before then, um, we was in the high schools doing a lot of volunteer work. So we started talking about the youth apprentice programs to get people interested in being technicians. Because most people thought technicians was a dirty job. They didn't, they'd never been to NASCAR and seeing how clean the floors are and the settings are and everything in, in the automobile business going to computer, it's computer driven. So they didn't know that. So we sold that the whole time we was in high schools. Yeah, it is, it is so far different than it was 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, so what, uh, uh, again, it can be a dangerous location, an auto body shop, if you don't know what you're doing, how do you manage risk and liability and, uh, where do you focus your time with the students? Is it on me mechanical work or other sorts of, uh, occupations? Well, basically we make sure we, we, we've had a mistake when we started it in four years ago, um, I was recruiting everybody I could, could recruit anybody wanted to be a technician. I said, just sign them up to be a youth apprentice <laughs> technician. So the first year I fell on my face because we're getting 10th and 11th graders that had no clue about it. And then we found out some 10th and 11th graders didn't have driver's license, so they couldn't drive a car. Right. You know, so after, the, after that, falling in my face for a while, um, we kind of focus on serious 11th graders who was serious of being a technician. And I talked to their parents, I recruited them, I recruited their parents and make sure that they wanted to be apprentices. And then I, for 12th graders, when they graduated, I looked for them because they got mm -hmm. driver's license. They don't have to worry about the proms. They didn't have to worry about football games, baseball games, basketball games. They out of school. So we would, we, now we recruit mostly um, 12th graders ready to graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, I love hearing, uh, uh, good things you've done, but also hear about mistakes that are made, because I think that's how a lot of people can learn. And there's a lot of pressure just to throw students, uh, students into jobs. Um, but my question is a little bit more specific. It's not on the list that I have, but, but I run into this all the time. So you have nine stores. Do you have apprentices at all stores? We have just apprentices in all stores, but Volvo and Volvo get their apprentices from the Volvo plant. Okay. You know, they, they run their apprentices through the plant. So one of the really important things about apprenticeships is that the site location has a supervisor mentor, has somebody who gets it, who can not only supervise the student, make sure things are safe, um, also provide support and encouragement as needed. How do you spread that across nine shops? I mean, that's not the easiest thing to say, okay, everybody, we need to get you all on the same page with this apprenticeship work because you might have somebody who's been around for 40 years says, I don't want to be bothered with some kid or other people who don't quite understand what you're doing or are in the same position. How do you deal with, with spreading that culture across all nine, all nine sites? We get that a lot. Okay. One thing, every store is looking for technicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a technician shortage like everybody else has a shortage. Another thing that if you live in Somerville or North Charleston or Goose Creek, you work in the North Charleston area because you cannot get to West Ashley from Somerville in the morning to get to work. And I found that out by mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. You live in Mount Pleasant or Johns Island, James Island, West Ashley. Then you work on the Savannah High, Highway stores. So that's how we kind of focus it. But everybody want me, like our Toyota store is right across the street from Tech, Trident Tech. Toyota store, they do the best job. Our Toyota store does the best job in, in training youth apprentices and they want all of them, just like I want all the youth apprentices to come through Trident Tech. But you can't have it. You got to spread the love to everybody. Okay, great. So, um, uh, and you guys are new car dealers for the most part? Well, we sell, we new car dealers, but we sell new and used cars. New and used. Okay, so there's, there's, there's plenty of work to go around. Okay. Um, uh, so what recommendations would you have, whether it's the automotive industry or anybody on that supply chain or really just any employer, 
when you start out, what would you tell them to avoid uh, in the first year? And what would you tell them to focus on in the first year? It's probably totally different in restaurants and hospitals and in the, in the automobile business, because like I say, I focus on 12th graders ready to graduate because I know they're serious. And then mm -hmm. I still talk to all the parents, you know, because I got this, I'm, I'm selling everybody because this is a career. You know, if you be a technician, technicians stay with you forever. You know, we got technicians that have been with Hendrix for 35, 36 years of one manufacturer. So I, I, I sell hard and say, this is career. You know, you start off, this is what you got to do. You got to go to school. You got to work. While you're in school, you're making money. You're making good money. Where some of your friends are going to college and they ain't, they still living off mom and dad. You know, I have a lot, you know, we have 35 youth apprentices that we recruited. Um, we have nine youth apprentices that dropped out of the program, but the, we, out of the nine, we had five that stayed with the dealerships, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of them became ser service writers. I had one guy that's a service writer and he's our number one service writer in town. Mm -hmm. um, then the other, other four guys are just lube and tech guys. You know, they just change oil, rotate tires. And mm -hmm. that's good because that's what we need. And then a couple, couple of people that we had to fire because they wasn't doing the right thing like any other employee. You know, I, I was going to say, that's probably like any other employee, <laughs> you know, and they say, you know, the danger is somebody says, oh, my apprentice, I had to fire an apprentice. I'm done with them. Well, you do that with your other employees, too. Exactly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Don Smith with Kendrick Auto, thanks so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to move. I say the best till last, David Brown. Sorry uh, to make you wait, but I'm really interested to hear about uh, Keon Tech and a little bit about your apprenticeship programs. Tell me about your company, if you could. Well, thanks for uh, setting a high expectation. I hope I'll let you down, Eric. Thanks for hosting this too. This is a good discussion. So, um, so I'm with Keon North America. We're part of the Keon Group, uh, which is a company that's headquartered in Germany. Um, worldwide, about 38,000 employees. Um, we're the second largest company in the world manufacturing um, material handling equipment. So you think forklifts, pallet jacks, reach trucks is, and we also have a very large business in what we call supply chain solutions, which is mm -hmm. automation sorting. So basically we do everything that could, if you think about like an Amazon warehouse, which everybody's ordering from these days, we can supply all the hardware, software, and uh, equipment to make that building run. So that's what our company does. And in and, and Somerville, which is a, a suburb of Charleston, is our North American headquarters. Um, we've got about 300 employees in North America right now, probably going to be 500 within the next year and a half to two years. So. And um, how did you get engaged uh, with apprenticeship? Did it... Uh, you know, well, you know, Eric, I've been in the company for five years, um, and I came from another very large uh, German manufacturing company that had an adult apprenticeship program mm -hmm. or a regular sort of true apprenticeship program, not a youth apprenticeship program, um, where we grew our own folks to become um, mechatronics technicians, um, mechanics, electricians, et cetera. So I was familiar with the concept mm -hmm. from that experience and then um and and also that company that i was previously with had a very tight relationship with trident tech so shout out to mitch and rob wiggins and those guys over there um so when i came to keon in 2016 um i saw the opportunity not only to tap into the youth apprenticeship program from a um labor supply standpoint, but just as much as a community outreach program. Um, so I view it as sort of, it's, it's two, two ways. Number one, it helps the company, but number two, it's, it's helping to support education in the community. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we started back in, um, I think, late 17. So we've had about four years worth of experience. We've had some ups, some downs. Um, but overall, it's been a very good experience for us. Mm -hmm. And the, um, and uh, let's see here, Don, I know you have a meeting coming up. So when you do have to go, just sign off. Thank you very much for your time. So, um, so David, what, what, 
are you focusing, how many do you take a year and what are you focusing them on? We usually take maybe two mm -hmm. a year. Um, we're not a huge company. So, um, and most of those folks work in our manufacturing processes. We do have one gentleman who I think was on the previous panel um, uh, who came in with a clear desire to go to four year uh, ME type degree. So we got him on board and he has completed his apprenticeship and will begin um, finishing his last two years for a mechanical engineering degree at the Citadel here in South Carolina um, beginning next year. So he'll end up hopefully becoming one of our star mechanical engineers that supports our manufacturing uh, operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in manufacturing, any liability issues for you guys or do you just manage it away from hazardous work? We do a, well, first of all, you have to be 18 to operate a forklift. Mm -hmm. okay? and we make forklifts, so that's kind of a dichotomy <laughs> for us. Um, so we also, like I think Don or someone else mentioned, we try to steer more towards the folks that are seniors or even post-grads, maybe just graduating from high school, so mm -hmm. they may already be 18. Um, but we appreciate Trident Tech providing the liability insurance for us. Mm -hmm. um, we have had one case of a youth apprentice that engaged in some, let's say, I guess you could call it horseplay, which mm -hmm. ended up costing him his job because mm -hmm. it was a, a safety incident. Mm -hmm. um, those things happen, you know, and it could be and a year old kid doing it, or it could be a 38 year old person doing That's it. That's right. So. Right. Right. Really important lessons in the reality of the workplace, I might add, which is the other byproduct of apprenticeship, right? It's not just to figure out the skills in the occupation, but how to get to work on time, how to get along with people and how not to horseplay. Um, Absolute. So do you have any trouble with your apprentices getting to the jobs or transportation issues? We got a lot of questions about that. Um, or do they make it okay? No, we always... Uh, no, they all make it, um, you know, obviously we have attendance standards that are in place and, and one thing that Trident Tech does, which I would commend to other parts of the country is they have, last year did not have, but in typical years they have like a recruiting um, event on a weekend in February where there's like a, a, a job fair almost. So, in the students attend with their parents and at that point, they get to go around and see different companies and meet with reps from the companies. And we get to talk not just with the students, but with the parents to find out, you know, mm -hmm. is this student going to be able to make it? Are they reliable? Can they get, do they have transportation, et cetera? So um, to me, that's one of the greatest value adds that Trident uh, gives us here in Charleston. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, um, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute or two. I don't know. They're probably going to give me the hook. Yep. I got to wrap it up. Um, but real quick, um, if I could, uh, David, um, did you uh, have to sell it up the chain to your leadership or are you the leadership who had to sell it down the chain to the on-site supervisors, online supervisors? Uh, did not have to sell it whatsoever um, because the people that I partner with that are my peers had also worked in other companies that had engaged with apprenticeship. So, um, and, and our company has a lot of new leaders in it, a new meaning relatively short mm -hmm. in the company. So we all saw this as a great opportunity to try to mimic some things that we'd seen from our previous lives. So it was great. That is great. That is great. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of foreign companies, Switzerland, Germany, et cetera, who are familiar with apprenticeship. So it's not a big a leap with those companies as well. I'm going to have to sign off, but Debbie, I got one quick question for you. Cause I think it's a good one. When you, um, uh, hold on, David, I, I'll get back, but Debbie, did you get, um, when you had to talk to an international cyber audience, were they saying youth apprenticeships? Are you nuts? Uh, did you get any of that or were they fairly well accepting of it? Surprisingly, they were very well accepting of it. Okay. Um, there was a lot of questions coming from um, other employers concerning that. And yeah, they were very receptive of it. That's great. That's great. So I guess security clearances will become a very important thing for their future and they better watch what they do so they don't blow their security clearance. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, David, I, you know, I just wanted to talk about, you know, the, 
you know, college, college, college is the call we all get. You gave a great example of a young man who came to the apprenticeship program, then went on to be a mechanical engineer, is trying to become one. Do you feel that any of the students feel like they're less than college material, or do they? Do you think they're getting? They feel they're getting an advantage uh, uh, over college. Um, do they see it as a second-rate program? Do you think, or do they see it as a top-rate program? No, absolutely. I don't think people see it. I think the people that are interested in working in a company like mine are realizing that, um, you know, you go to Trident Tech for free or nearly free, paid for, um, and then you finish your apprenticeship. And if you want to hang on, you can make a very, very nice income at a young age and have zero college debt. And I think that's a real calling card for folks these days. I would agree with that. And I'm going to get the hook. I probably should have hooked off about two minutes, two, three minutes ago, but uh, I, I want to thank you all for joining me. Um, uh, Debbie with Cyber, um, uh, Don with HMGI Charleston. Uh, who else? Everybody else. Don Smith with Hendrick, David Brown with Keon. I'm sure I forgot Rowana with HCA Healthcare. Anyway, thank you all. You guys got an incredible employee employer culture down in the Charleston region. I know in a large measure, that's to the foundation that our friends at Trident has laid and some of the key partners they have, including employers. So I wanna thank you for your time. I do this nationally. And I have to tell you, I'm always so impressed with the folks in South Carolina and Charleston. With that, I'll sign off. Thank you, sorry I ran over and uh, let's continue on to the next session. Take care. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shelton Dahl. I'm a program associate with the PI team at the Center on Education and Labor at New America. Um, many thanks to our amazing employer panelists for sharing their experiences and insights with us and to our moderator, Eric Selmsau. Um, join us at 2.35 Eastern time for our next panel, Creating Seamless Credentials and Careers, Aligning K-12 through and Higher Education Systems Through Youth Apprenticeship, moderated by Mimi Lufkin from the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity.